Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Bobber Academy. This is episode six, uh, Bobber Team 5G Tips. I'm Jess, your host, and today we have our resident guests from within the Bobcat team. So collectively, we have about two decades of 5G experience. Um, with us on the team today, we have, as always, our favorite and my co-host, William, our support specialist, Josiah, our deployment specialist, and Tony, our 5G hardware expert. Um, so for today, our uh, segments will be, um, Josiah will be setting up or talking about setup and deployment tips, and we'll be going over Bobber app features for 5G now and upcoming. Um, William will be going over Bobber 500 specs and analysis, and later at the end of the episode, I'll be doing a Bobber 500 teardown to show you some of the components inside. Um, so to kick this off, uh, Josiah is going to get started and show us more about the setup and deployment tips. Cool. Thank you. Um, all right. So the Bobcat team has put together a infographic for outdoor or just for um, multiple radio setups. Uh, we have basically two different types of setups um, that are split into two more uh, setups. Uh, the first one is a simple setup, which you can see right now and also an advanced setup. Um, you can differentiate between them by the green and gray backgrounds. The green is advanced and the gray is the simple setup. Um, the simple setup um, basically has more wires, but it has all the power capabilities that's uh, already included. The only thing you need to buy that is extra that is not included is the gigabit switch that you see there. Yep. Um, setup is for the most part, pretty simple. Um, you have your router already um, that has internet. And from the router, you're going to connect a ethernet cable to the WAN uh, connection port in your Bobber 500. Um, I'd like to note here that if you're using Cat5e cables, um, they're only basically good up until 100 meters. So anything above 100 meters, you're going to need a Cat6 or a bug. I, th I believe it goes from cat six, seven, and eight, I think now too. Um, so going back to that, all right. So the next part we're talking about is we're going to be connecting the E and B switch from your Bobber 500 to your gigabit switch. Um, switches will vary, but usually they have a, a dedicated port to where you can uh, plug in your E and B switch from 500 to there. Um, the other three, or four ports, whichever, however many you have, will be going from those to the three radios that you see here. Um, because this is the simple switch, each radio is going to have to be also powered from their own power supply. So this is why we call this the simple one is because um, all the stuff is there already there for you. So um, I think that's it for the simple one. Uh, moving on to the advanced setup. This is also for indoors. Basically, the main difference is, is because it's power over Ethernet, each of the radios is not going to require its own power supply. It's going to be getting the power from the gigabit uh, PoE plus switch that we have here. Um, this setup differs from the last setup um, because the switch that you use here is going to need going to be have to be a PoE plus switch. Um, these are a little bit more expensive, but they'll save you from having multiple power outlets um, that you need. So the same thing applies. Um, the WAN goes into the uh, 500 from your router, and the ENB goes into the dedicated uh, port in your PoE plus switch. Um, please make sure that the switch has enough power to power your three radios. Depending on what radios you use, they will require more power. For the indoors, they're about 21 to 25 watts. So you need to make sure your uh, PoE plus switch will uh, have enough power for that. Um, I think the one we have here recommended is a Netgear, but there's many different products you can use. So that's it for the indoor setups. And if you go down, we also have the other two setups, which are simple and advanced, but these are for your outdoor. Um, these are basically going to work 
almost the same as your simple um, and advanced in indoor setups. However, for this one, actually it's pretty much the same. Uh, for this one, the only difference is instead of a normal power switch or power adapter supply for your outdoor radios, they'll be going into a PoE injector. Um, each PoE injector will need its own ethernet cable. So please make sure you have enough ethernet cables. Um, we've already um, counted how many cables you need. And basically for a whole setup for outdoor radios, you'll need about eight uh, ethernet cables. Um, and if you move on to the advanced setup, um, advanced setup will require the PoE plus switch, just like we said before. Um, but this time, because uh, of the PoE, the power of Ethernet, you're going to require you're not going to require you're not going to require all those injectors anymore. And so that switch will power all three outdoor radio or, or outdoor CBRSs. So. Um, these outdoor ones, I think, are from most labs, and they are rated at 21 watts. So once again, please make sure that your PO switch has enough power to power those switches. And I think that's it for that. Great. Thanks so much, Josiah. I want to make one comment on about the uh, cable length. Uh, uh, no matter you are Cat5, Cat6, Cat7, normally you, you don't want to run the cable longer than uh, 100 meters. Oh, okay. If you do that, do run longer. Um, I think uh, your it, it, it still can work, but your your speed, for example, if you you are rating at one gigabit gigabit per second at one hundred meter, when you extended that lens, you might not reach one gigabit per second speed. So there will be some degradation, even with the sixes and the sevens. Yes. Okay. And Josiah, um, I guess the next section is, uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about uh, some extra tips for uh, mobile Genesis? Uh, yep. So for a mobile Genesis, there are some, it's going to be a little bit different than uh, later down the line. Um, for right now, please make sure that your Ethernet cables, you have the correct ones. Um, a lot of uh, customers have had issues with using Cat5 cables. Um, which aren't going to be transferring uh, fast enough data in order for you to uh, hit the 100, 100 megabits download uh, threshold. So we recommend Cat5e and above. And for mobile genesis, please temper your expectations for short-term and long-term rewards because at this point in mobile genesis, um, all radios are getting the rewards, no matter if they meet their speed requirements for now or even... Um, if they don't actually have any good reception for uh, other 5G phones and everything right now. Um, later on down the line, even on phase three, the speed will matter. And also um, how much data you transfer over the radios will matter. So um, some, maybe your radios will do really well right now. Later down the line, they might not do well if they're not in a good spot. Um, for long-term installation or long-term installations, it's always better to have a redundant power supply because if power goes off in any of your um, single point of failures, we call it, then your whole setup goes down. And that means you're not earning any tokens for any of your radios. So if possible, get multiple switches, get multiple power supplies for your radios and your Bobber 500. Um, another tip that is something we want you guys to also take note of is if you're using the buy cells 430Hs. Um, if you look on the documentation for the buy cells 430Hs, they require a PoE++ power supply. Um, right now, almost everyone is, most people are using PoE+, um, and it works fine with getting rewards, but further down the line, um, that may not be enough. So people with PoE plus installations with buy cells 430Hs might have some issues later on the line, um, but we don't know for sure right now. So um, the issue with a lot of people not wanting to get the full PoE plus plus switches is they're very expensive. I think a switch right now for PoE plus plus is $500 or above. So the switch is for that. The PoE plus switches for the muscle labs right now are maybe 100 to 200, so they're quite affordable. So, 
those are the main tips that I have. Um, anything else, Tony and guys, company? Uh, are we going to show them the deployment options like uh, the three sector and uh, indoor? But we can still show it if you think it'd be very helpful. Um, yeah, yeah, why not? Um, because when, when you mentioned the uh, um, beyond Genesis, I, I think uh, where, where do you place your radio uh, in a good position? Uh, it would be good to show some examples. All right, so if we're talking about um, moving on beyond uh, mobile Genesis, there's we put out an infographic for do's and don'ts when you're deploying your 500. These are generally for outdoors. Um, uh, so each radio um, that you see here has a beam width. The only one that's an exception is the 436H all the way on the right side over there. Um, both the Mosul Labs Outdoor and the Bicells 430H has a 65 degree beam width. So that means when you're setting up an outdoor deployment, you want to target um, areas where there's a lot of foot traffic, um, where people are gonna be using their phones a lot, and also where there's not a lot of uh, 5G coverage already. Um, you can see the dues over there on the left side. Um, take account of the radio's beam width. Um, you also want these antennas uh, on high ground as such as rooftops or maybe um, even on you know balconies or wherever. Um, before, when you set up an outdoor radio, the CPI registration required you to have a 20 feet um, minimum height, but that isn't being enforced anymore. So as long as you have it registered and uh, with the CPI, it should work no matter the height, I believe. Uh, correct me on that if you can, Tony. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, I, can, I can confirm he's correct. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think they, they just don't do the time feed anymore. Yeah, my personal experience is that uh, mine, the yeah. ones I've set under around 15 feet, have been uh, accepted. Um, so, yeah, focus on areas with high foot traffic there. And then you want to direct the antennas where, um, where there's a lot of traffic, obviously. And once again, keep your cables under 100 meters to. Uh, to meet up with the speed expectations. Anything more than 100 meters is going to be affecting your speeds, and that's going to be affecting your rewards later on, too. And you also uh, want slow moving uh, objects as well with yes. connected devices. Yeah, so having it like over a freeway, it might have a lot of traffic, but it's not going to be usable unless you're in LA traffic. So, so the best places are like <laughs> coffee shops, bus stops, gyms, things like that. Yep. Um, these are for outdoor setups, but yeah, yeah, those places are going to be very good. Please do note, though, that um, 5G reception can't go through walls and concrete very easily. So you may have some obstructions like that that might not go through very well. So yeah, don't deploy in places with freeways. Um, also, try not to point all your radios in one direction. Um, if you look at the bottom right corner, um, this is a sample setup. If you want to cover almost a 360 degree area, this is going to be a three radio setup, just like the advanced and simple setup that we looked at before. Um, you want to have it at 120 degrees. There will be a few dead spots, but for the most part, they'll cover most things. Re please remember that your setup is going to vary. Some people will want to cover one direction much more than a different direction. So, you know, your 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 mileage may vary, I guess. And um, as of right now, our recommendation is to do three radios. You can go up to four, I believe, on most things. Um, but the general consensus is try not to connect more than five radios per gateway. That's, I think that's about it for now. Great. Thanks so much, Josiah. I have a couple questions. Yeah, um, I, I, you're right. I, so for the connect up to five, I think that's also what Boris mentioned in the last episode, where he said, yeah, maybe you can go five, six. Just in terms of um, you, if you can do it, yes, you can. And then on the dashboard, you can connect up to 10 or even more. But then you do have to, after mobile genesis, you have to climb up your roof again and then take those down. So if you want to do it in terms of 
is it going to really be useful coverage and then the deployment is it going to be valid and maybe four or five is probably a good number to go for um i, I do actually have two follow-up questions related to the outdoor deployment um i do see on discord there are people asking if i have an outdoor radio what is the length or the distance that you can cover uh, some of these people come from the time where they were deploying LoRa hotspots and they were used to a LoRa antenna covering like a couple miles or even 10 miles in a very open uh, area. Um, some of these answers customers are getting vary from one mile to three miles. So I, I wanted to ask like Desai or Tony, is this a good um, answer to say that the outdoor radio can cover say like a mile or three? And then also whether this is the right question to ask as a customer if they buy outdoor radios should they be asking this questions and this is like what's going to make them have maximum reward yeah i think this is a legitimate uh, legit uh, question to ask because um, um yeah that's going to affect your your traffic uh i mean the uh, data throughput um so i think for the met for the uh uh for example, BISO 436, it's, it's actually not a small cell, it's a, a massive cell. So it's higher power, so it can reach to 10 miles according to the data sheet. Um, so basically, uh, normally you, 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 you were mentioning like you are in near cell, mid-cell mid or, or, or uh, age, right? So when you further out to like, um, like the 10, 10 miles, you will be probably at the edge of the, the cell. And then you will probably get a very poor signal. It's, you can still connect and with a, a lower speed. And when you are in the mid or, or near a, a near, near range, you, you, you get a higher a speed. So, um, and for, 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 for 430, you probably have a, a, a because of the radiation power is uh, lower, so you probably get like a five miles. But I, the, the, I think uh, between uh, three to five miles. Yeah. And for the indoor radio, it's probably just a couple of uh, maybe less than 100 meters. Yeah, I think the, yeah, the data sheets usually say for the outdoor muscle labs and the BISOLs for 30H, it's up to three or five kilometers, I believe, on for the mid. Um, but I think real world usage, I think a lot of people yeah. have noticed that it's basically like not even that, maybe half a mile, a quarter a mile is where the good reception is. Um, I believe documentation has said that the higher up, the better. Yeah. But if you're talking about 20 feet, then it's not going to be, it's not going to be <laughs> about yeah, two or three yeah. miles. So yeah, that, that's why you see all those telecom towers. Right? It's, it's pretty like <laughs> couple of uh, maybe 50 meter above the ground and then you can you can have no obstruction because any building uh, trees uh, anything in between the paths will re cause refraction refraction diffraction all sorts of uh, uh, things combined so your, your your signal to noise going to go down with distance so yes yeah, so, so I think that the data should Give you the ideal situation that if everything is ideal, you you can possibly reach that range. Yeah, I would say probably the data sheet is line of sight, maybe. So no obstructions whatsoever, but real world, you're not going to have a situation where there are no obstructions between you and the phone that's connecting in most cases. So, and, and you, if you are in the uh, 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 in the city, for example, then your range is probably uh, going to be very, uh, just uh, uh, on the street, you, you can go further, but across the street, you, you might you know, not be able to make the, the call, something like that, yeah. I guess then the answer really to this is it depends, because I guess when you were talking about the 436, um, is the macro cell or the 430 or the 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 muscle labs outdoor these data sheets are designed also for optimal placement like if you do it properly and set it up as a cell tower then yes you will get as up to say 10 miles for the macro cell or maybe three mile 
up to three miles for those. But if you're just deploying on your balcony or you know a little bit better just outside of the window, then definitely it may be 50% of three miles or even less. So I think that's that's a concept where people are still trying to to figure out. And I think the idea is, oh yes, the, the the bigger the range, the more reward I'm going to get because I cover more. But they also need to realize that that also means that you have to set it up properly with with actual height, not just on your balcony. Yeah. So 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 even when Jesse are talking about, she can do it in uh, how many feet? Twenty feet. Uh, yeah. you're, not, you're not going to make a lot of a DC. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think there was a question around, uh, will carriers such as T-Mobile be able to offload onto the Helium 5G network in areas where the carriers have priority? Um, Tony, do you have a... I think at the moment, uh, we only go in one direction. So when you are uh, with the premium, uh, helium premium five sim card uh, and you have a, a coverage by the helium network you'll be able to make a connection but once you're going out of the range then uh, you're going to uh, roam, roaming over to a uh, t-mobile network but not the vice versa because we don't have that data overloading agreement uh, yet it, it, will, it will be done in the future but uh, not at this moment okay so only from Helium Mobile, uh, when they provision SIM cards uh, for the network and have phones that we can use, we'll be able to, anyone that's using them or has that SIM in, will be able to offload onto T-Mobile for coverage yes. outside of us. Okay. I think um, a good thing to keep in mind also with that is in the future when you, you can offload from carrier to Helium, you're not going to be setting up a Helium 5G hotspot near a cell tower and then overpowering the cell tower and taking over traffic from the carrier. It's really designed to be placed in places that have poor coverage from the carrier and a supplement that, that coverage. So most places like in the city where you have good 5G coverage, setting one up, you're not necessarily going to take in a bunch of traffic just because it's there. Uh, it has to be stronger signal than the carrier's signal would give them. And then, or maybe in certain cases, if it's more lucrative for them to transfer data that way, that might work too. But in general, you're not going to be stealing a bunch of traffic, I, I think, depending on how you deploy it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, because um, there are three levels, right? So first level is the Navy, uh, uh, the, the original owner of the spectrum. And the, the second le level is the, uh, the, the telecom. Okay. So uh, if, even you have a strong uh, cut signal, when you have an overlap, I think you won't get the spectrum to send transfer your data because uh, T-Mobile or other uh, carrier have a higher priority than uh, us. So most likely you are not go going to transfer your data. But unless there's a, some agreement that uh, they, they are offloading uh, there are some features they can like uh, a certain uh, condition met, and then they will turn, they will be offloading the data to our network. Yeah. yeah, one of one of the situations that we've been talking about a lot is in certain areas where there's very strong carrier coverage ready, um, like maybe some places where like theaters, stadiums, where when there's a lot of people there, um, when it's it's overloaded where you might have full 5G signal, but you might not be able to do anything because there's so many people on that network. So one of the questions I've been hearing and I also want to know is um, once the offloading, I guess, can go the other way, can T-Mobile offload to Helium network then? So like if it's if they can't handle it, they'll offer it to the Helium to take over. I think in the big event, most of the big uh, telecom carrier will have a, a, a will add more resource in, in that area. So most likely, uh, probably not not going to offload to to here network. And also, since our our uh, radio is fixed, right, you cannot just say, "Oh, we have event, we move to uh, nearby." 
so um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's kind of hard to uh, compete in that case. Um, all right, I think now it's a good time. Yeah, just one, one, one more comment. Yeah. Because uh, like, like event like that, they have a, they, they can have a, a, a equipment in the truck and uh, move over to the stadium and putting some like uh, not spacing in, in, in. So so basically, you know, they they will take all, all the uh, you know spot. So basically, that's uh, yeah. I think kind of what I've been hearing is an ideal setup would be something like you know like a beer garden where maybe there's a lot of people that come in. They spend a lot of time there, but if it's indoors or if it's in a spot where this 5G signal is not good, then you can kind of supplement that. And there, it's an area where it's like you were saying, it's not really lucrative or a good use of resources for a carrier to come in and provide extra supplementary coverage, like a stadium or a big event maybe would be. Just a business, a coffee shop, a beer garden, something like that. They're not going to roll in an extra you yeah. know, tower just for that. So being able to supplement that would probably be a good opportunity because then you don't have to compete as much with the signal of the carrier. And you can also provide that coverage and people will be there for extended periods of time connected and transferring data. So, Yeah. For example, uh, a sport park or, or uh, uh, yes, that, that type of uh, place is it's good. Like you know, every Saturday, uh, Sunday, there were people that's uh, playing sport there, and that would be a good place to, to set up the, the radio. So if you live next to a park, you might be doing pretty well. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm planning to put up one in my brother's uh, house because uh, his house uh, across the street faces a sport park, which is uh, very, very, very uh, busy during the weekend, so. Yeah, I think it's also mentioned before, like other places. Um, I think, yeah, Will, Bill just said the uh, beer gardens, but I was also thinking maybe in large cities, underground bars or underground tunnels where there's stores and everything. There's not too much of that here in LA, but I'm pretty sure there's a need for it in different cities. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm going to try and move us into the next segment. Um, we're going to be talking about Bobber app features for 5G now and upcoming. I'll let Anne take over from here. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, we have added some features on the Bobber app uh, to remotely monitor different 5G gateways and radio. Uh, the first time that we updated these features were uh, mid this month. Um, we basically added some uh, speed test related information like download speed, upload speed of the gateways, as well as the latency. Uh, these are going to matter a lot more uh, down the road when speed test is implemented. Essentially, if they don't need the 100 down, uh, 10 up, as well as the 50 millisecond latency, then they don't make any rewards. Um, when we implemented these features uh, where you could remotely just log into the Bobber app and see these uh, QoS of their gateway, um, at the time, it was the only way to see it remotely if they didn't know how to download a gateway log from the uh, local dashboard. But now if you go to the Helium uh, blockchain, you can actually see all of these data on the floor as well. So you can see that um, what kind of internet speed your gateway is providing and also a little bit of more radio information. So in, in this article, when we added these features, we also um, showed users basically how to use the Bobber app to monitor uh, your 5G gateways across multiple wallets. Because a lot of people, they actually have um, say five, six or 10 5G gateways across different wallets. And then with the dashboard, what we can do is that once you link uh, your Bobber app to one Helium wallet, that hotspot in the wallet will show in a dashboard. And even if you unlink from that wallet and link a different wallet, the hotspot will not um, disappear from the, the dashboard. 
So basically say if you have 10 different wallets and then in 10 wallets, you have one gateway each in there, you can simply just link and unlink uh, your Helium wallet with the Bobber app each time with one wallet. So ultimately you will be able to see all 10 of your gateways uh, shown across the dashboard. So it's just one view for all of your gateways. And then later today, we added another feature, uh, which is now that users can also remotely monitor the pulse of the radio and how many mobile tokens per radio is making that are connected to their gateway. Um, so basically, the, these are the three added features. First is that uh, once you connect the uh, you, once you connect your wallet to the Bobber app, and then you click on the gateway, you will able to see how many radios that gateway is connected to. Um, for example, in this picture, you can see that there are two radios that are connected to one gateway, and you can also see the radio type, the outdoor radio and indoor radio. And then you can also um, see how many uh, mobile tokens uh, your each individual radio is re receiving on a daily basis. So here there's a number that you can see, which is basically, this is your outdoor radio. And then for the reward that was swapped yesterday, this one received 32,500. And then this indoor radio yesterday received 13,000 mobile tokens. So this is always a daily update. So if, if any of these numbers ever drop to zero, then you will know, oh, okay, I, I either have a problem with my outdoor or my indoor radio. And here we also show the last four digit value. If you actually go to the, the dashboard today, you will probably see the full uh, complete serial number or the device serial for your radios. So the, the usefulness of this is that you can identify uh, if there is a problem with your radio, say that you have three radios and you're only just making a reward for two radios, you need to know which one is not working. So for this dashboard, uh, the way to find your device serial for your radios is that you go to the local dashboard. So if you have a Bobber 500, you go to Bobber dot, uh, gateway, uh, Bobber dash gateway dot local to check under the radio dashboard and see the, your device serial or your serial number for all of the radios. But then with this, you have to do it only locally. But then if you connect your wallet to the app, you can remotely see the serials of all of your radios. So if one of them doesn't receive tokens, you can always um, point to the serial number and then specifically troubleshoot that one. Uh, these are some of the features that we have now. And then, of course, according to um, the new 5G POC hits that are coming out very soon, we will probably also see how many more features that we can add. A, a question that users ask is that, oh, usually the, the first question they ask is, does this only work for the Bubble 500? But actually, we now have this uh, feature work for both the Bubble 500 and the Freedom 5 Gateway. So it doesn't really matter which um, 5G gateway you decide to choose from. And then it doesn't really matter if you have the indoor or the outdoor radios, or you have the buy cells or the muscle labs. It's all supported by the Bobber app. So we really encourage our users to download, give it a try, and remotely monitor everything and see your token. That's great. Thanks, Anne. And um, I had a question. If, say, you're a Freedom 5 gateway owner, you would not be able to see any of this from the Freedom 5 dashboard. Uh, you would have to download our app to be able to see all of these great features we have, right? Yeah, so if you just look at the minor and radio dashboard, um, it kind of has to be local. Um, I, I think the only way that you can see it remotely is either through the Helium blockchain, the Explorer. If you go to the Explorer page, there is some information about radio status, um, speed test and latency. Um, and then we also want to make sure that from our app, we, if, if it is available on the Explorer, then that we want to add it in the app and maybe a little bit more. Potentially what we have been discussing is that um, how do you also display the tokens per radio? Or this is what the community has been asking. How do I know exactly um, how many tokens my radio this radio or that radio is making. I think with the serial number, we're able to see now, okay, this, this radio is making these many tokens and this radio is not working. And 
we'll see what other features that we can come up with going forward. That's great. Does anyone else have any questions about the uh, Bobber app features or any kind of upcoming features they're looking for? I would say um, if there's a feature that users want to see, they can request that and we can look into it. That's definitely something that we like to do, get feedback from the community and see what, what new features are wanted and what we can do. Great. And how could they submit the, that ticket? Um, so if you go to bobcatminer.com and um, you can submit a, just as you would submit a treble ticket if you were having an issue with your miner, there is a section for the Bobber app and there's a section for uh, request improvements or submit your ideas for improvements. You can filter it that way and then we get those requests and we send them over to the development team, let them know that features are being requested. Um, you can also request them on Discord and let us know what kind of features you'd like to see. Perfect. Or they could uh, leave a comment in the article. It's uh, some of the features that I mentioned, it, it happens. It doesn't happen a lot. It happens where people leave comments and asking, how do I do this? And this article literally just addressed how you do it. For example, how do you uh, have all of your gateways show on the dashboard across multiple uh, wallet. Uh, I think a lot of people, first of all, they, they didn't really realize that they could do this. And then once they realized they have this need, they wanted to know, okay, then how do I do it? I think sometimes maybe they just kind of need to read the blog a little bit and to see, oh, okay, actually it's listed there. Or maybe next time we can do some videos and just visually show people, this is how you link one wallet have that gateway show on a dashboard on link it, and then relink a different wallet have the second gateway show on a dashboard and just do it as many times as many wallets you have. And then finally, you will be able to have all of your gateways show on the dashboard. I do wanna add real quick, um, if you do have a suggestion that you wanna submit, um, I would do it either on Discord or by submitting a ticket. Uh, we do read the comments on the articles, but it, it, I don't believe it gives us a notification. So there's a chance we might miss it. I did pick up one the other day that someone submitted for uh, expanding the speed test so it shows um, two decimal places worth of speed, not just you know one megabit and up. Uh, so we did get that from a comment left on the blog, but I don't think it notifies us. So just to make sure that we see it, I would recommend Discord or submitting a ticket. Great, thank you. Okay, um, let's move on to the next section. Uh, in the next section, we're going to be talking about Bobber 500 specs and analysis, and William's going to take over from here, and I'll let him share a screen. All right. Can you see the article here? Yep, we can see it now. Cool. All right. So uh, we have come out with an article that kind of gives you an idea of the different specifications that are important for a 5G gateway. So that way you can kind of compare and contrast and see what you need to look out for when you're selecting gateways. Um, the gateway is important because it runs the access gateway software for the mobile core. Um, radios connect to it. It handles configuring the radios, um, connections for the phones and everything. So it's very important. Um, they need to be robust and they need to last a long time. If you're going to go through the trouble of deploying an outdoor setup, you want it to last for a long time. So the reason that the hardware for the access gateway features is not built into the radios is because at the moment you can use a gateway um, to connect to multiple radios or other way around, multiple radios can connect to the gateway. Um, if you were to integrate it with radios, then every radio you deploy would have to have that additional hardware and software, and that would increase the cost. And not to mention the radios do run kind of hot. And so any added heat will make the components last less time. So it's better to split those out and more cost effective in the long run. Um, it's better to have a dedicated hardware device for the AGW rather than being cloud hosted. Um, there can be bandwidth limitations if you 
are hosting somewhere that's really far away that can introduce latency um, network delays and it's it's much more decentralized that everyone can run their own AGW rather than it being controlled maybe by Bobcat or another company or another centralized um, authority that's controlling the cloud um, infrastructure for the gateway. So it's more decentralized that way. Uh, the most important specifications that you should look for when you're trying to choose a gateway uh, would be the processor or the CPU. Uh, RAM memory, and the network connections. So those are the, the component specifications. And then aside from that, you want to make sure that the gateways are made to last, that they can withstand temperatures, um, environmental concerns, and that they're built to uh, run cooler. So the higher temperature electronics run at, the more they break down. So the cooler a gateway can run, the longer its lifespan will be. Um, and then uh, with the Bobber 500, you can mine uh, mobile tokens if you have the attached radios, but you can also mine HNT right now, which will become IoT once the hit passes for the IoT token. So you can dual mine, you'll have LoRaWAN coverage and 5G coverage. So that's a bonus also of having the dedicated hardware. You wouldn't be able to do that if you had a cloud um, gateway set up. Uh, for the processor, this is a component that does all the processing, kind of like it, uh, self-explanatory. So you want a good, fast processor that can handle the traffic that's going to be uh, offloaded for 5G. Uh, processors are rated by their number of cores and their clock speed. It's a good way to compare and contrast processors. And they also have a TDP or thermal design power that's kind of an indication of how much power draw they have. The more power draw it has, the higher the temperature. So lower TDP is good. Uh, for the Bobber 500, it runs an Intel Atom X6413E processor. It's got four cores and a clock speed of 1.5 gigahertz. And that can also boost up to three gigahertz um, with turbo mode. And it runs at only nine watts, which is lower than some other competitive processors. Uh, for the RAM, the RAM is like the short-term memory. Um, so rather than your storage, like your hard drives on a computer, which stores the memory long-term, if you turn it off, turn it back on, it's still there. RAM is a short-term memory. Uh, it's important because it, it takes things from your storage and feeds it to the processor more quickly. So the more RAM you have and the faster the RAM runs, the faster it can transfer data to the processor. Uh, and that's rated by its capacity and its uh, frequency. So the Bobber 500 runs four gigabytes of DDR4, which is the newest standard of RAM. 3200 megahertz. Um, the storage memory is important also. Not so much um, anymore since the light hotspot uh, took over for the IoT or uh, the LoRa mining. You used to need a lot more storage to store the blockchain, but now we don't store the blockchain on the hotspots anymore, so that need has been reduced. But you do want to make sure that you have fast memory or fast storage memory specifically. Um, that also helps with transferring data to the RAM and then to the CPU. Um, so there are hard drives and solid state drives. Hard drives are like the old spinning platter drives that you would normally see in computers. These days we see a lot more solid state drives. Those are faster, no moving parts. They don't really generate a lot of heat. Uh, they last longer and they're much, much quicker than hard disk drives, which have the spinning platters. So the Bobber 500 runs a 64 gigabyte M.2 SSD. Um, M.2 drives are faster than the standard um, SATA interface drives, which in your computer, you have a cable that pl plugs to the um, hard drive and then plugs to the motherboard. In laptops, it kind of slots in. Uh, that interface has been around for a long time and has slower speeds than uh, M.2. 
um, that can use PCI Express lanes, which are normally used for things like graphics cards, things that need to transfer a lot of data. So the data transfer is faster from that. So that can get your data off the storage and into the RAM quicker. Um, networking is important. You want to have gigabit uh, ports. And like we mentioned before, if you use switches, if you're using cabling, you want to make sure that it can handle gigabit speeds. Um, the way networking speeds work, the technology before gigabit was 10, 100, so up to 100 megabit, um, yeah, 100 megabit speeds. So if you don't get the correct switch when you're setting up your setup and you get a 10, 100 switch, um, you'll probably not pass that speed test because 100 down is the requirement. If you have a 10, 100 um, equipment anywhere in the chain, that will not, 100 is the theoretical limit, but it's not going to hit that. It'll probably hit 90, 95 at the most. So you want to make sure that you have gigabit equipment. The ports on the Bobber 500 are gigabit. The Both the WAN and the eNodeB port are gigabit. So as long as you use a proper switch and proper cabling, you'll get more than enough speed there. And then um, the AGWs are an important part of the infrastructure, so they need to be secure. Carriers won't want to offload to a network that has AGWs that might not be secure. So it's very important to know that they're tamper-proof, uh, that people can't really hack the software. Um, so we use Secure Boot, which it's a way of when the computer boots up, it has a signature, kind of like your antivirus would have a signature of a virus to compare things to. It'll compare known good software and what it's reading from the storage when it boots up. And if they don't match, then it won't boot. So that's a way to make sure that no one can tamper with the software, with the firmware. If there is tampering involved, then it'll know that and it won't boot. It also has a trusted platform module. So that's a hardware component um, that allows crypto cryptographic keys to be stored and it allows for disk encryption. So the reason that's better than using, say, a software program to encrypt the drive is that since it's not stored on the drive itself, if you were to take the storage out and try to put it in a different computer to access it, to do anything nefarious with it, uh, it would be encrypted because it needs that TPM chip to decrypt the information. So that also prevents situations like someone taking the storage out of the Bobber 500, booting it on something else, messing with it, and then putting it back. Um, so they that makes it even harder to tamper with. And then the last important thing to consider is thermals. So like we mentioned before, the hotter something runs, the less it's going to, the less time it'll last. So um, you want to make sure that your gateway can run cool. So the Bobber 500 chassis, if you notice, um, the actual unit of the Bobber 500 is a lot bigger than, say, the Miner 300. And it's not a, only because the internal components are bigger, but it's also by design because the actual chassis itself is built to draw heat out of the components and expel it into the air around it. So if you look at the back plate, um, it kind of has fins on it, almost like a, a heat sink would. That helps dissipate the heat out. And the CPU inside uh, has thermal compound that connects it to a heat sink, and that heat sink is thermally connected to the back of the chassis. So the heat's generated by the components, and then it's efficiently transferred to the body of the case and out. So that's why if your Bobber 500 is running and you feel it and it feels really hot, it seems a little weird, but it's a good thing that it feels hot because that means it's expelling the heat from the internals. So it's designed to run um, a lot more cool. And um, pretty soon here, we should have an article coming out explaining the testing process that the Bobber 500 goes through. So it's run through extensive thermal testing. Um, I won't go into super deep details now because that's up and coming, but it's put into controlled environments. It's ran at 100% um, very hard usage, and it's monitored 
and we make sure it doesn't exceed a certain temperature rating or have any errors. So um, that information will be coming. And then uh, another thing to consider would be the grade of components used for the gateway. So consumer grade hardware is things like your normal home router, video game consoles, um, phones, things like this that you use on a daily basis. Enterprise grade hardware is higher quality. It's made to withstand heavier use and last for longer. Uh, that's things like server hardware, things that businesses would use that they rely on for uptime. And then industrial grade is a step higher than that. Um, it withstands extreme operating environments, heavy use, things that are uh, run in factories, um, military usage, things like that. So the Bobber 500 was made with inter, uh, industrial grade components because we know it's gonna have to last a very long time. If you go through the trouble of deploying one of these setups, you wanna know that it's gonna last for a long time. So that's been thought of and, and built into the very components that we use for it. And then we also have um, exact specifications listed for anyone that's in, interested in the uh, the super technical details. Uh, it goes over the all the components. It's got uh, benchmark results for the CPU, and this is all available on our knowledge center. So anytime you want to look at it, um, all of that technical information is there. And like I said, pretty soon we'll have a an article going over the thermal testing process if you're interested in that as well. This is this is great. Thank you, William. A lot of really good information here and overview about the Bobber 500 gateway. Yeah. Also, I want to add uh, uh, one comment. Um, uh, our, our board is uh, designed from scratch with uh, the best industrial component to meet the, the strangest uh, operating environment uh, as compared to uh, maybe other vendors uh, using the commodity board and older generations. And uh, so, yeah, that's one uh, thing I want to uh, point out. Yep, definitely. Yeah, it's, uh, I think you were telling me about that a little while ago, uh, just how much older the components are in some of the other vendor uh, 5G gateways and how much more advanced ours are uh, as far as like a generational speed upgrade and performance. Yeah, and also like uh, those uh, vendor claim convertible, uh, yeah, you are converting from a very old technology and uh, it's not going to meet the, the future demand. Yeah, and we can uh, get into now. Um, I can start share screening. Um, so for this setup, we wanted to show you the basic setup for a uh, 5G miner and an indoor radio. If you were to have one or more uh, indoor or outdoor radios. Uh, this basic setup requires just a uh, indoor switch uh, or an, a basic switch. And this one above it looks almost identical is PoE, but the difference there is it's providing power to the, uh, to the switch and that would go out to all the radios. And you have to use a substantial size uh, power unit to power this. Um, this is a think uh, 123 watt power supply. So it's not small and can power all of the radios and then some. Um, but for this basic setup, uh, the radio will need its own power supply. So you have to supply power to the radio itself and to its own port there. And you'll also have to supply power to the Bobber 500 unit. And that will be its own supply that comes in the box when you purchase a Bobber 500. So that will have its own power supply there. Um, but if you're trying to power multiple radios in this scenario with a basic setup, what you wanna do is have your ethernet coming in from your main line to the home uh, to your Bobber 500. And then from the Bobber 500, you want to send your ENB out to your basic switch. So in this case, we're going to plug it into the first port, and this will provide power, 
or this will provide Ethernet to the entire rest of the uh, outports on the switch. Um, so from there, we want to connect the first radio that we have now to the second port. So because we have the main internet coming in from the Bobber 500 ENB, this will now send data to all the rest of the ports. And in this case, we're powering or sending internet access to the first radio. And that's for a basic setup for one to three radios. Um, if you were to do the advanced setup, it's basically the same, except for you don't need power anymore. So you can disconnect the power to your radio. And in this case, you would put the ENB into the first port of the PoE uh, switch. So now it's sending data in, and it's only going one way. And then you're sending data and power out to the radio. So now this radio will turn on without a power supply. You can see it coming on now. And now we have data and internet coming to the radio. And those are the two different setups that you can use. Um, this one allows you the freedom to not have to have an extra plug for the radios that you might be setting up somewhere, maybe in a location where you can't find another outlet. And you can send, uh, I think, up to 100 meters of Cat5 or CAT6, um, and that'll power your different radios that you have and send internet access to them uh, at gigabit speeds. So those are the two different setups. Um, and then I'll move into Teradown. All right. <clears throat> so for this next section, uh, we're going to open up the Bobber 500 and show you this is the heat sink um, on the back of the unit. Uh, this dissipates all the heat. And we'll separate the there we go. There we go. So on the back side of the heatsink, you'll find a thermal pad that connects to what is this called, Tony? It's the thermal heatsink. Tony, oh, you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, so you, you can tilt your uh, the, 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 the box so you can see from the side and the heat sink uh, very thick and connect it directly on top of the CPU. Yep. Okay, so that's the heat sink in the middle. And yeah. This is our thermal pad over here. And what we have on the far right, this is the concentrator, I believe, for the LoRaWAN uh, yes. unit. And uh, I believe this is the mm. connection for that unit. For the power, uh, yeah. And the, you, you see those thing on the button? Yep. I, I think that's for the Ethernet chips. He sync, he sync for the Ethernet uh, right next to the Ethernet port. You see those uh, uh, metal things? Oh, right here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is for the Ethernet. That, that's on top of the uh, uh, Ethernet chips. Okay. And then on the back side of this unit, there's uh, the memory. Yeah, you have to you have to remove the the four screw to mm -hmm. review the up opposite side. Then you will see the uh, uh, the DRAM and the uh, SSD. Okay. Yeah. I have a, I, I think I have the picture in the uh, PowerPoint. So. Okay, and we can use that later. Yeah. yeah. And is is that memory uh, upgradable by any chance? Um, yeah, but we'll we'll do some te some tests to confirm. Yeah. So, I, I yeah, in principle, it should be upgradable. And for the, for the hard drive, uh, for the uh, SSD storage, we might not not be able to do it uh, with, uh, by customer because uh, the, the, those uh, security uh, things that uh, William mentioned. So you you how do you say that um, the the signature of the security will change, so that would mm -hmm. that you know, prevent you from from yeah, booting, and also also the encryption of the the disk data also uh, prevent you. But uh, um, it's upgradable from the factory, so so that's the inside of the Bobber five hundred um, without tearing it down too much further. Um, and doing this would actually void your warranty, correct? <laughs> so you don't, Unless you don't want to ask that. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you have any repairs that need to be made, please do them, uh, send them to us and we'll uh, 
work on those issues. All right. Um, all right, let's uh, wrap this up. Um, so this is the inside of the Bobber 500. And uh, we went over a bunch of things today about uh, the Bobber specs and analysis, um, the Bobber app features for 5G, and now upcoming features. And we also went over setup and deployment tips. And I want to thank everyone from our team for helping share all their knowledge and great information uh, with everyone here today. So uh, thank you, Tony and William and Josiah and Anne. I uh, appreciate all of the insights and information, and I hope this uh, helps other users uh, within our community and within the Helium network understand a little bit more about these topics. Um, so for today, that's uh, we'll call it the end of the show, and thank you everyone for coming. Appreciate uh, everyone for being here, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.